Let's just have you guys introduce yourselves the way sure. you would like to. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm Kendra, and I've been playing the cello since I was four. Music is a big part of my family. Um, my mom's a cello teacher. My grandmother's a piano teacher. My uncle is a bassist in the Toronto Symphony. So my path was decided for me. Um, but I love it, and I'm happy with what I chose. Went to McGill for my undergrad and my master's, uh, and now I'm trying to make a life as a musician in Toronto. Uh, I do sub with the orchestras that you've mentioned, and uh, now I'm teaching. Sometimes I do gigging, but with everything going on, it doesn't happen as much. Um, and then also, thanks to my relation with Julian, I record for artists outside of this room. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so I'm Julian, Julian Altman. Um, I'm a violist currently in Toronto, living with Kendra. Um, I grew up in California. My music life was not predetermined. My, none of my family members are particularly musically inclined. Um, but yeah, I fell in love with the piano at a very early age and started composing and then picked up the violin when I was around 10 and switched to the viola in high school when I joined the San Francisco Symphony Youth uh, Orchestra uh, and toured Europe with them. Um, and after that, I never went back. I, I just became a violist. I loved the instrument. Then I went to UCLA and studied with uh, Richard O'Neill. Um, and after that, moved to Canada, uh, Montreal, where I met Kendra at McGill. And now I'm a student at uh, the Glenn Gould School in Toronto. And... and um, yeah, that's what I do um, most of the time, but I, I also record um, and arrange music for artists uh, in L.A., mostly through my friend uh, Emmett Fenn, who I met in L.A. Awesome. I love how you guys introduced yourself. That was that was great. Much better than what I did. Oh, you did great. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're both, I mean, you're both doing the freelance thing, which is, like, I've been thinking... I mean, that's what I would be doing if I didn't have this job. And damn, it must be really hard right now. Yeah, I mean, that's why I went and got the vet job. Before COVID hit, I was literally, I remember a couple weeks before, because I'd been bouncing around with all of my sub, sub uh, gigs, because um, I was doing... I did Kitchener and then I had to go straight to Thunder Bay and then I came back into Kitchener again and then I also played with the Mandel Philharmonic in Toronto and then I was supposed to play with the TSO and I was just not able to fit my part-time jobs in anymore and so I was like oh my goodness am I going to make this transition to where I can finally drop these part-time jobs that have been kind of just like a just-in-case sort of situation and then COVID hit and I was like oh well guess not <laughs> guess this is now my main source of income mm. um, so I'm, I'm not entirely a freelance artist now in the sense of that's my main source of income I used mm -hmm. to be but now I do have those side jobs and mm -hmm. then Julian is still in school so not completely freelance but mm -hmm. yeah I remember how disheartening it was um, at the very beginning because you had gotten so much traction. Like we moved to Toronto in September and the first couple of months were rough. We didn't have any freelance work, basically. And then, I mean, you were looking for students for a really long time. You finally have some students now. Um, but yeah, you, you started really like getting a lot of gigs, getting called for a lot of stuff. And as soon as you started feeling comfortable with that, it just got... You know the rug was swept under your feet yeah um so that because yeah, would... you, you need this like momentum right when you're building yeah. especially when you first move to a new city you're making at least at least six months that you're you know really yeah yeah that's pretty much what it was it was six months of like working really hard to find work and then she got it and then it just disappeared um mm -hmm. i mean i think you know when when things start going back to normal in like a year or so maybe less <laughs> <laughs> those, those connections will still be there, um, but it, it'll still feel like you're starting over again. I don't know. My concern is that the arts programs are just going to take such a financial hit that they're not going to be able to hire out 
subless musicians right away when COVID comes back. So I don't know. I don't know how immediate like it will be more gradual but i am looking forward to doing auditions again i miss having that like it was i was literally doing like one every month i did one every month for starting in what november yeah pretty much mm -hmm. do you think there's going to be like a flood of positions opening after this or do you think it's kind of going to trickle i don't think so i don't know i I feel like maybe because I mean, I, so many orchestras have lost so much money. But at the same time, I feel like maybe there's people that were thinking about going in retirement in maybe the next five years. But then mm. with COVID happening, they were like, oh, might as well just start now. So maybe there will be that situation. Yeah. True. So I don't know. It's hard to say. So, yeah, any over 65s that may be listening to this, it's maybe now is the time to. <laughs> <laughs> There is young star generation. <laughs> the next gen is is waiting in line, <laughs> eagerly. Oh man! I didn't get to play with anybody besides Kendra uh, for months and months, which you know is which is the case for most people. Um, but this year, they they were actually allowed um, to permit students to come into school and have private lessons, and we even did uh, we even did a RCO concert, an orchestra concert. Uh, with 50 donors in the hall, we performed uh, Mozart's Hafner Symphony um, and uh, Beethoven's Emperor Concerto, Piano Concerto, oh, um, nice. with uh, Jonathan Crow, uh, Joe Johnson, and a few other members of the TSO. So that was really, really fun experience without a conductor. So Jonathan Crow was leading from the oh wow, uh, which is not something it's not something I've had a lot of experience with, like playing in a large group without a conductor. Mm -hmm. um, so having him lead and he, he did an excellent job and just like having all those people, all my friends on the stage with me. Um, and I mean, we were distance, but Kerner Hall is like such a nice hall that we were still really able to hear each other and, mm -hmm. and like perform pretty, a pretty convincing performance, I think. So yeah, we're really grateful for that. Um, classes are all online. Lessons are in person with Steve. Um, and uh yeah so far it's been it's been actually a pretty rewarding experience um i i had my doubts going in i i wasn't sure i was gonna do this second year of my artist diploma um just because of of the, the pandemic and like not knowing how the school year would pan out um, mm. but they did a really good job of making it safe and still pretty productive Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I stuck with it. I recently had a, a lesson with uh, Mr. Dan. Oh, yeah? Really? Over uh, over uh, Zoom. Really? What yeah. Was that? Uh, this was a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Did you yeah. tell him that you he know you know us? I no, I don't think we've ever that's ever come up. Yeah. Have you had a lesson with him before? Was that your first one? No, I've had a couple with him. Actually, I was. <laughs> When I was, uh, uh, last year when I got this job, I, I had just graduated and I was, my options were either go to GGS to study with, um, uh, Steve Dan or, uh, take this job. And he, he actually like helped me figure out, um, what to do, but, uh, it was a tough call cause I, you know, he's so great and that great. school, that school is amazing. He's very wise. He's good at giving advice. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. Yeah, I was telling him too. He we had a lesson in back uh, in February. Seems like a different life now. Yeah, he um, he had the big iPad, right? And he, I brought in like a Lamentations of Jeremiah, which is the this. Do you know it? First know it, yeah, yeah. And and it, you know the the music is like this big and. Uh, so I brought it in and it could barely fit on the stand and it was like flopping all over the place and he was just like You got to get an iPad. <laughs> he said that to everybody yeah, He loves his little <laughs> And at the time I was like, oh, I can't afford an iPad But he was showing me all the features and and then uh, and then later, you know I did end up getting an iPad and now I perform on the iPad and um so this this past lesson, I said, hey, guess what? I got an iPad because <laughs> of you. <laughs> Did you get the pencil though? Oh yeah, you need the pencil. <laughs> get the pencil. I actually I airdropped 
um, someone in my section uh, yes. something uh, yesterday. And it, I, we did it so fast. I was like, ready for an airdrop. <laughs> She's like, ready. And I was like, and it happened so fast. That's great. It's the it, future. Could you imagine if is, everybody no. in the section had an iPad and they were like, I'm confused about this Boeing. And then the section leader could just go airdrop Boeings to the rest of the <laughs> Yeah. And then you just like. Yeah. And you can even link all them together so that one person has to do the pedal and it switches all the pages for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I haven't figured out how to do it, but I know it's possible. Except if that one person screws up, then... <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, everybody yeah. can just get their own pedals. But as principal, you get paid the big bucks, you know, to have that kind of responsibility. <laughs> you, you, you have to do the page turns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I definitely think that the, the audience will be more there after COVID, for sure. I've, I've already noticed just in general, whenever I play for people during COVID is that they're like, oh my God, I miss, I didn't realize how much I miss. Mm. Yeah, the appreciation will definitely go up. Yeah. Hopefully more. Uh, more attendance as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it took to uh, get people yeah. to appreciate just a global pandemic. Simple fix, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw you did a, um, Kendra, you did like a, was that a wedding or you were you were masked and you had I've done a few weddings actually they all ended up being outside um we did we did one inside yeah. oh wait oh yeah we did one inside and it was kind of it was went back when we were like stage three so when the it was kind of like after the big wave and we'd gone down um so we did do one inside and we kept our masks on the whole time and it was like less than 20 people and then we moved to play outside as well um, and then besides that, all of them have been outside, which I've never had to add a clause to my freelancing contract that says that I can't play outside and below 15 degrees Celsius. Yeah. It's never come up before, <laughs> but now I'm learning that I need to add that to my contract because obviously our instruments don't really function when it's cold outside. It's also my hands don't really function. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah, there was one that I did when it was eight degrees outside and they had a space heater, but honestly, if it had been longer than an hour, I don't think it would have lasted because my hands were starting to get very cold. Mm. But some of the weddings you did ended up being like really cute, quirky, like intimate yeah. things. There was one I did, uh, it was like in the Beaches Park in Toronto, and they didn't... Kew Gardens? I, I, I don't remember. I, they just were like, it's the Beaches Park, and then I had to go to a specific parking lot and then like walk, and they just put, dropped a pin at this like one beach area in the park and they didn't even like rent part of the park it was literally just like 10 people who showed up and they like hung a wreath on this um lifeguard chair and just had me like sit and it was just yeah it was but cute you also did a few like in people's backyards mm -hmm. with just like four people yep that was the one with the heater. It was the this couple who had been together for 40 years, but they never got married. And so mm -hmm. their daughter and their son like threw them a wedding just in their backyard. And so they were in like the screened in porch area and I was outside. Okay, so, that's the one I think I saw the yeah. picture of. Yeah, yeah. I have played in a duo with um, a couple uh, significant others to very varying stages of success, um, are you? Do you guys like? Do you fight like in rehearsals? Like, is it? it are there challenges because you guys are so intimately connected, For and sure. then you're trying to do this work? I I love that that video by the way yeah. that Kendra that you posted. Kendra I thought didn't it was... want me to post that. She didn't, she didn't tell me she posted it. I posted oh, it and then he saw it. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> That's bad. You should have told him. Yeah. Yeah, well, I liked it because it was so honest. It like gives people a chance to see, you know, what it's really like. Because all anyone sees is, you know, the finished product that's very polished and put together. And a lot of people who aren't musicians probably don't know what the rehearsal process looks like anyways, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's different for everybody. Um, yeah. Even between the two of us, we, I think we have different ideas of, 
what needs to be rehearsed or like priorities in rehearsals um and that that's what a lot <laughs> of the we we do have um, oh, yeah. we we always manage to resolve it um yeah that's kind of the the goal is always to resolve it yeah by the end of the day yeah <laughs> oh it's, it's, the, it's the day not the rehearsal because the other thing yeah, it can it can kind of it can end can, the rehearsal sometimes. It can <laughs> it can bleed into right because yeah. you know if there's like a conflict or a difference of opinion that gets heated, and then yeah, you don't just leave rehearsal. You just go in the other room and you eat yeah. together. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we definitely. So when we were doing it for Julian for school, when we were kind of having our regular lessons with Steve. Um, that was kind of the first time that we were ever playing together intensively. No, in France. Well, yeah, that was two years ago. Okay, yeah, recently. So recently yeah. intensively. <laughs> and just kind of going hand in hand with like, this is the only person you're seeing for three months. And then also you have to work with them in an artistic and professional manner. It did start to get a little rough. Um, we're very different uh, in the way that we learn music. I'm very um, organized and just kind of, uh, I'm kind of a drill sergeant for myself and whoever I rehearse with. And I'm, I can be very intense and I know that about myself. And Julian is kind of the opposite. He's very late. Um, can you say that again? He's very, did you say laid? laid he's very laid back. Julian's very laid back um, in I don't know, just in life in general, he's a very chill person. Um, so sometimes when I want something to be perfect and he thinks it's okay, then that's kind of where it's it starts to be the issue. Um, so yeah, we ended up taking a break from playing together. We kind of stopped in August and like, well, when school stopped, we basically stopped playing yeah. together because we didn't have lessons anymore. There's no performances in sight. So, yeah, part of it was because it, it was getting difficult, but also because, you know, we had nothing to work for. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, she, she's right. Like, uh, she holds herself to a very high standard, you know, when she practices, when she performs. Um, definitely perfectionist. Um, which is uh, <laughs> something to strive for, really. Something that, like, I don't, I don't have the work ethic to like. I mean, to some degree, I have to try to make things perfect. But I think the way I, I would prefer to rehearse is um, like thinking of the broader musical gestures um, and getting those in place and sometimes that will um, resolve some of the minute details. Um, but the way Kendra wants to rehearse is she wants to work on the details first. Mm. Um, and she wants to like get every little thing perfectly together, everything perfectly in tune, and then work on the broader picture. Um, but I, I really like starting with the global um, like image of the piece and like the phrases, and then like, then try to get everything together um and probably in less detail <laughs> um, interesting but... yeah I, I i feel like i relate more to your way but also have a mixture of the two because i think it oh. makes sense to start with a global um idea and then then zoom in but then you also have to be able to zoom out right to see yeah i mean yeah. But there's merits to both ways and you should you should be able to do both you know um but I think what we struggled with the most was whenever we had to like work on something like intonation, um, because you know, she just took violist. she just took like a big breath when you said <laughs> <Yeah>. that <laughs> intonation. And what I was gonna say is just accepting criticism from each other. Oh, accepting that's criticism so from each hard. other and not taking it personally and understanding. It's so hard. Yeah. yeah, it's that's probably the biggest thing, just because. We, when we're we're all musicians and we've we've worked so long in our on our art and then it becomes a part of who we are and we take 
we take it personally and it's hard not to take it personally um but we've yeah. i think we've come far we've gotten a lot better we have um like when the we... recent rounds yeah we've done a lot better i mean as musicians you have to have strong opinions you know in the way you play something otherwise what you play doesn't have any character um and so we're all, i mean musicians butt heads all the time um when they don't agree on style or articulation or something like that because there's so many ways to interpret something and when you disagree with somebody it's it's hard not to take it personally it's hard not to be insecure about your own ability your own ideas um like validation is is really important um so i i think you just have to listen to each other agree to try everything anybody suggests um and not take anything personally it's easier said than done but after two years i think we're getting there <laughs> yeah we've progress we've been together for three years we've been playing yeah. together for off and on for two years mm, okay yeah well that's awesome as you guys see progress that's great i think like there's so many things like wrapped up in what you said like yeah this sort of like I, I identifying your personhood and your worth with your work right with your with your ability to play and your 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 we're so connected to uh our judgment being you know like holding that close and and if someone questions that especially someone we're close to that can feel very threatening um yeah. But yeah it you just have to realize that it's not you know you're both working towards the same goal of yeah we're on the same team yeah, yeah. you just you're trying to perform together you know you have to let go of um when you play in a duo you, you have to let go of some of your um not your identity but like you have to make compromises yes like you can't be right every single time nope. yeah <laughs> as much as that would be amazing it's not possible mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's just learning to work as a team honestly I think it gets easier when the group gets larger mm. um, because it becomes less personal um, you're obviously not living with your quartet for example <laughs> um, so there is that distance um, and there's more of like there's a majority that can form you know in a duo there's no majority there's <laughs> yes, always one point. v one it's never like three v one or mm-hmm. like with yeah. musical opinions you mean yes yeah 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 you can also kind of phrase things i find in a group that leaves things kind of nebulous as to who you're talking about you know you yes. can kind of be like let's we should i think try to. yeah we should try i suppose you could do that in a duo but it's more obvious that you're trying to implicate <laughs> the other, right? Yeah, whenever you say we, she always I, I means do that you. all the time. I do that. I try to say we, and I try to say it in a nice way, and he calls me out on it. He's like, I know you're talking about me. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so, it's so delicate, like how the tone of voice, how we phrase things. Um, it really it really matters because someone can say something that's helpful and needed in a way that's um constructive or they can say it in a way that really puts someone on edge or like makes them have their back against the wall and get defensive right yeah 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 do you find that in your past relationship duos you've found the same problems oh yeah okay yeah yeah um (laughs) oh you you guys are not alone i think it's like amazing what you're doing and i think um everybody who's in a duo with somebody that they're involved with um and especially if they're living together like i think it's really it can be really challenging and you have there's there's so many boundaries i think that people who are really successful at it probably have very good boundaries they probably feel like you know, this is rehearsal time and this is our professional way of talking to each other. And then the rehearsal's done and we we have that separation and we go back to being in love and in our relationship. And that's a different dynamic, right? Yeah. 
I mean, a lot of musicians marry musicians. So you, you, you end up playing with your partner in a lot of situations, um, but not always in a duet uh, yeah. configuration. Um, but and some, some couples I know don't play together. Yeah. And there's a reason. They're yeah. like, we're not going to play together. Like we tried it, not happening again. <laughs> interesting yeah it's kind of like you don't want either extreme right you don't want to be like we need to play together because we're in a couple but you also don't want i wouldn't want someone being like i could never play with you because (laughs) you know what i mean like you want a nice balance and you want to be able to create those like healthy yeah along those lines like i think the most fun we've had playing together is probably when we fool around at like weddings or something where mm-hmm. we're just like playing pop music. Yeah. Pressure is pretty low. We're just having a good time playing, you know, fun, easy music. Um, like we still really enjoy performing like our classical duos, but we're, we're definitely ha- having more fun together when we're just like jamming. Yeah. 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 Because there's almost less, um, yeah, there's less involved, less connect, um, you're less connected emotionally to it yes, in a way. Definitely. It's not something you've like practiced for several hours. Yeah. And then you don't have, you don't have the baggage of multiple rehearsals <laughs> weighing <laughs> on you. <laughs> yeah. I think too, I, I, I sometimes think like with our intimate partners or with um, sometimes with friends, close friends or family is a big one. Um, we're not, we forget to be like polite. You yes. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I really mean that, like, we're kind sometimes, but, like, actually, like, considerate and polite in the way that you would treat a colleague that you don't know as well, right? Like, you wouldn't say, you're doing it again to, you know, <laughs> to someone you don't know. You'd 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 put in that extra thought and effort, usually, most people would, to... Yeah, um, yeah think, it's, a, it's yeah. a double-edged sword, though, I think, because when you're when you're so close you can have that honesty and you can a lot that way because you know kendra might point something out to me like every time you play a fourth finger it's flat every time you play a second finger it's sharp you know and like <laughs> i don't really think of this but imitation of me <laughs> every time you do this <laughs> <laughs> pretty much um so having that honesty is actually a really if you can harness it and not abuse it, it's like a really, really important tool to have. Because when you play for colleagues, sometimes, like you said, they'll be super polite to you and they won't actually tell you what they mean. Mm. Um, but then you can have like a nice professional relationship. Um, so there's like, there's two sides to that, I think. Yeah, I mean, for your mental health, but also for your career. If you can't work with people in a productive, constructive way, you're not going to get hired again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's such an essential life skill, not only for music, for anything to like be able to to communicate well and listen well. If you can't take criticism and it brings you to a point where you just shut down and can't play, then you just can't have a career in music. And I'm sure we've all played with people like that. (laughs) Do you think that's more more likely to happen, though, if you are in an intimate relationship with a person? Because you feel like you can't get away. I don't know. You can't get away with something like that in a professional context. But if you're in this dynamic with someone, um, like, does that make it easier to sort of get away with bad behavior? In a, in a way, but in the end... You know, you live with this person or... Yeah, you're you're stuck. (laughs) Not stuck, but, you know. You have to learn, like, if your relationship's going to last, you have to learn how to communicate. (laughs) Um, And we've definitely gotten better at it over the years. Yeah. Yeah, we've obviously had our struggles. Everybody does, I think. Um, Yeah. But, yeah, communication and proper communication is at the top of the list, I think for compatibility. <laughs> Absolutely. And so how was how was lockdown? Okay, I'll preface this by saying I had a conversation with my therapist and she said, "Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people with relationship struggles, divorces, separations, breakups, or just massive communication fails." 
um, <laughs> during this time. And she described it as kind of like the lockdown was either causing issues, perpetuating pre-existing issues, or it acted as some kind of a pressure cooker over existing problems. And people are just going nuts. Like they're just going crazy. They're going stir crazy with their partners. Um, so I, the fact that you guys are still together, playing together and getting along, that says something. I mean, we've just kind of made activities together. Julian was good at, I mean, I would get really depressed sometimes, just like we talked about before, um, that I'd been kind of on this like climb of just working really hard, practicing six hours a day, doing all these auditions while also having jobs, while also whatever. Um, so when COVID happened, at first I had like this small sense of relief of like, oh my God, I can take a break. But then after two weeks, realizing that this break was going to last for like over a year, I just got really, really depressed. Julian was really good at kind of making activities for us to go do. And so we'd go out and he'd be like, let's go play soccer. Let's go play Frisbee. Let's just go for a walk. Um, yeah, we do. And things like that. in the months before COVID, we were both traveling a lot. Yeah, we didn't really get a lot of time together. Yeah, she was... She was off doing gigs, you know, every week. Um, so we, we actually didn't spend a lot of time together in like January, February. Um, even for like weeks at a time, she'd be gone or I'd be gone. Um, so when COVID hit, like we, we actually had time together in, a, in the first time in a long time. And we really enjoyed that for a while. I mean, we obviously struggled. <laughs> for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for you know, a couple months, and then we, we struggled with the the length of of just being, you know, alone together. Um, but in the end, I think we it made us closer. Yeah. Mm, that's the goal. That's awesome. Yeah. I also had, like, little mini projects. I, like, started doing pole, and then I also started more recently like I guess two months ago I started doing the whole Instagram um, promotion thing and then Julian got us some work with um, recording so I don't know we we kept busy had our own projects played a lot of video games a lot of video games a lot of video games <laughs> what do you guys play I don't know any video games so I was obsessed with Animal Crossing um, I played it every day. <laughs> so he's, right now, your 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 partner is shaking his head and going. I just I don't under, I didn't understand the draw. Like she okay. she would play the game for hours, like every day for months. Wow. I just didn't. But I mean, I I do the same with different games. So I, I really shouldn't judge. But he like, likes FIFA a lot. Yeah, the soccer game. But I yeah, that sounds fun. The <laughs> the past. What's couple days we've been playing cyberpunk 2077 okay which just came out which is a horribly buggy game like it's so frustrating every time you walk around somewhere it takes like 20 seconds for the world to load it's like <laughs> terrible but it's a fun game really fun despite that they'll fix it hopefully <laughs> the only game i ever played was sims back in the day i love sims sims is great i'm pretty sure we still have sims on your laptop I deleted it. Oh, okay. <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> okay, yeah. And like, what was what was food? Did you guys cook a lot or? Yeah. We signed up for every meal subscription service possible and used all of their like free trials and then eventually settled on good food. Um, and we really like it. We still use it pretty much every week. And... Yeah, we get like three three meals a week. But for the first like two months of uh, COVID, we used free coupons like every week. So we just get a free box of food from one service. And then we'd sign up again on the same service under a different name. That's genius. And, yeah, you should do it. Like we got like literally dozens like of meals six free. Weeks, six weeks of free food. Just free. <laughs> Why didn't I do this? I was spending like... <laughs> 
We'll send you the coupons. We have coupons. We'll yeah. send it to you. I was spending like more money yeah. during COVID on groceries and food. It seemed like because also groceries were such a big excursion. Like they, it was, it was like this is the event of yeah. the day, and like at the beginning, you know, I was like washing my food afterwards too, right? Like washing all the packages, and um, so it seemed like, oh, I need groceries again. Like, didn't I just go? And it was like this constant like coma of buying groceries and food, and it was just like, where does it all go? I don't know. But, yeah. um, so Julian, you, uh, I found out something I didn't know, which is that you also compose and you arrange and you work with non-classical artists. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about that and what you do? Sure. Um, so when I play, I, I built this relationship with my friend Emmett, um, who's a producer, songwriter, um, pretty successful. Um, he does a lot of advertisements um, and a lot of really cool projects himself. Um, and basically, just through this this one guy, um, I've I've built kind of a network um, of other producers, uh, videographers, songwriters, um, and I have I use this mic and another one um, and my laptop to basically somebody will send me a pop song unfinished pop song um that needs some padding in the chorus or maybe like a, a counter melody line um to the vocals or maybe they want like a cello line um for the bass um and i'll arrange it and record it and probably go back and forth with the producer a couple times um and yeah so i I've been able to work from home because of that. Um, Last year we recorded for Michael Bolton in our basement. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, for your basement. Christmas okay, stuff. you yeah. were recording from your basement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for for pop music, like the strings are often not the focal point. They're just like kind of filler, um, so they don't need to be like. I don't need to go rent a studio for two thousand dollars a day with like three thousand dollar mics. I have a hundred dollar mic, and I, I know how to use it. I know where to place it. I know how to use the software, uh, which was like two hundred dollars. So that's a like a total about four hundred dollar invest. Um, and with that, I'm able to record like pretty decent strings, all just like from this room. And uh, yeah, it's like basically the only source of income I, I had for a long time during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm glad I was already set up for it. Um, but the, uh, the music industry in the pop world kept going. Like concerts stopped, but people kept churning out albums, you know, like the demand for strings didn't diminish. It actually probably increased a bit because people uh, people can record from home. Mm -hmm. It's a little viable way of, of making an album or any kind of song, really. Um, and then I also wrote a song for um, a video that the Seattle uh, dance company, contemporary dance company, did. Um, they made this beautiful 15-minute video. Um, it's kind of a commentary on uh, on being in lockdown um and like dreaming of of being out in the world again and like uh dreaming of traveling and stuff um and not being like enclosed in in, in your home um and I, I wrote some of the music for it and recorded it here um and that was a really really rewarding experience oh that's amazing you, you should send me those links i'd, I'd love to see yeah it. sure I'll, I'll send it to you um I can't do that actually because they haven't they haven't released it yet to like okay. at, for free to the public so I can't yeah. send you that video. That's um, I could in like a year when they release it, <laughs> um, but I can send you other links to, to songs that I worked on. Sounds and him did an album together like that was like a year ago now. Right? Yeah, uh, of like piano and strings basically like atmospheric music to fall asleep to kind of really nice stuff. Um, mm. 
And so for the instrumentation, like you mentioned, like a cello line, for example, would you then get someone you know, or probably Kendra? Oh, it's me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's say you want to write for, you know, Barry Sachs. Are you going to go, are you then going Ooh, to find... Nobody is going to ask me to do that. <laughs> 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 like I'm, I'm an arranger for strings. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's the only reason somebody would come to me. As okay. if they want strings. And in pop music, it's pretty common to have like some basic padding in a just to fill out the texture. Um, with Emmett, uh, the strings are definitely a, like a focal point in a lot of his songs. So I get a lot of liberties. He, he basically just tells me, I, he doesn't give me any details. He's like, I need strings in the song. Send me anything you come up with. And then we'll work from there. So really, he just like lets me do my That's thing. That's great because you have a lot of creative freedom. Yeah. I mean, it ends up sometimes I'll send him like an hour's worth of like recordings and he'll like take one really weird thing that I did and like make it go backwards and like just like, yeah, he'll only use like a tiny bit of it. Um, but for some other things, yeah, I get a lot of of freedom and that's I'm really grateful for that. That's such a strange process in a way, right? Because you like you create this whole thing and then but you you have you have freedom over how it sounds initially, but you don't have freedom over its application. Yeah. In a way, right? So you're kind of like, I don't know how is this is going to be. I mean, I'm, I'm super biased. Like when I record something, I want it to shine in the song. But that's not that's not the function of it. The function of it is to kind of support everything else in the song because it's already pretty much a finished song and he just wants to like fill out some areas um he does feature me in in some ways um but really it's like i it's really very much in the background mm -hmm. um so whenever i play whenever i like mix it like myself there's like a lot of strings but then when he actually releases it it's pretty bare bones <laughs> which is totally fine it's his song it's completely up to him and i'm glad he he keeps coming back to me for for strings but mm -hmm. yeah the album though like the, the viola is a big focal point yeah the first his album is going to come out probably in the next couple months i think um and the first and last thing you hear is just like only viola mm. so it's it'll be kind of like a cinematic feel um, I can't wait to to hear what it turns out. Um, I'm very partial to that. I'm very partial to viola. <laughs> <laughs> I think violists, like more than any other creature, they like yeah. they are just so into viola. Like we're just so into viola. Like we just it's every so much time rarer. we're well, yeah, we're just like just Delicious. like beautiful, unique beast and every time we're featured in any way it's like oh viola the viola soul viola the viola yeah oh yeah 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 it's it's, it's but funny it's funny because a for for many years producers for film music for for pop music um sometimes we'll just have an orchestra full of violas like what sometimes they won't use violins at all because the 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 tone will be too harsh and a little bit um, harder to like mix in because it, it'll compete with the vocals. Is this real? Is what you're telling me correct? Well, you, you won't get like 80 violists in a room, but oh, you'll, like, okay. Okay. you'll have like, <laughs> like uh, I didn't get, know that many existed. They'll get like two violists to record the same line like four times. And you'll and then you'll have like a higher viola line, a lower viola line. So producers in the like pop industry really do appreciate the viola because it has such a warm tone that like adds a lot of texture to their songs. And the violin can send, kind of like cut through the texture. Yeah, which the is violin what they want. can suck it. Yeah. Yeah. Suck it. <laughs> That's basically to it's summarize what you just piercing. said. Piercing. <laughs> it's piercing. It's piercing. It's just stop. <laughs> yeah, just just stop. You know, like any violinist that's listening, just stop. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but like, yeah, cause is that a common practice? Like they actually do that with the viola? Yeah. I mean, before Julian started recording me, a lot of the times he would even like play something and then just like bump it up an octave or bump it down an octave. So they can like record it 
a bunch of times and then just like if yeah. they need the higher register just bump it up yeah just the range of the viola just is super middle like middle centric which is what a what a lot of pop songs are missing just like a nice full mid section because like it's always sort of framed as this instrument it, the imperfect instrument right in a sense like the the size and the the like acoustically it's sort of it's sort of imperfect because we're holding right. it like a violin right but the difference is that that's true but in like an acoustical setting uh, like in live performance, like when you're playing a quartet or orchestra, the viola is always going to get lost in the in the mix. But when you're recording solo viola at home, that doesn't matter because you're not competing with violins and cellos and and like you're not trying to produce like sound that will um, float through an entire hall. You're just like you're right in front of the mic. So it doesn't, it's not really an issue at that point. Right, right. Wow. And so for, let's say you, it's not always solo viola for these string lines. Sometimes you're using cello, sometimes you're using violin. Yeah. Who are, who's playing those instruments? Cello, violin. Okay. So you have, you have a whole string. Keep it in house. Keep it in house. You have a whole string quartet in your apartment, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much. Yeah. For a while, we were borrowing my sister's violin, but yeah. yeah. Amazing. And do you ever use bass, like double bass? I haven't yet. I haven't recorded bass before. Well, I, yeah, briefly, but not in like a um, commercial setting. Like mm-hmm. it was just for fun. Um, but. On yeah. one of his own songs, he recorded bass. Yeah. Um, okay. So you also have sort of a solo thing going on as well. Yeah, not really flushed out, but I, I do I do compose and write my own songs. Um, and he sings. Oh, sing and play too. the piano, and I, I add, like, drums and stuff um, oh, awesome. on the computer. Um, I haven't released anything, like, for sale in a really long time since high school mm-hmm. but that that may be in the cards in the future mm-hmm. yeah it's like a one-man band yeah that's yeah i mean that's what it ends up being um that's not necessarily how like if i ever did want to like pursue songwriting i would want help from friends mm-hmm. i would want like live musicians like i don't play piano well enough i don't play guitar well enough i I play a little bit of bass but really poorly um (laughs) (laughs) like if i did ever do that i i would want to like get a get some friends together and like do a a proper live recording not just do everything myself right Mm -hmm. cool i think of you as the pole dancing rat queen yeah, basically. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Julian shares my enthusiasm for rats with me. Um, Let's clarify: you're not talking about sewer rats. You're not talking about rats that run around on the street. They have how many pet rats? Nine rats was the most we ever had at one time. Um, too much. It's too many. It was not intentional. Um, but yeah, they only lived two to three years. So during COVID was kind of a rough time for our pets just because they all reached that two year old threshold. And then we had several of them pass away in the span of like four months. So it was really sad, but. Um, yeah, their their care is pretty straightforward. Like they're, they don't, they're not like, they don't, they're not high maintenance for like the first two years of their life. Uh, but at the end of their life, they they do get a lot of health problems. Um, so you have to take them to the vet a lot. You have to keep them on meds for months at a time. You have to always like check, you know, all for all possible symptoms because they're really good. They're prey in, or they're yeah, they're prey. Um, so they're really good at hiding their symptoms. And their metabolism, like it, you can kind of just think of it as their life is basically accelerated. So if you develop a cough over two days, like they can develop a cough over two hours. So it can just be, it can just, things can just happen really fast. 
um, yeah. with them. So but right of... now, all of our rats are very young, very healthy. Yeah, they're cute. Very playful. Yeah. So did you both have this passion for rats before you no, met? No, I had two rats that I'd gotten. Um, and on my f- our first date or our second date, Julian met them. And then he kind of fell in love with them. And then after we'd been dating for five months... I kind of joked around about getting him rats as a Christmas present, and then he actually said that he would like that, and so I got him rats as a Christmas present. Um, and then he adopted a rat before I even got gave him those rats. So he, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. I when I stayed with you guys in Montreal, I remember you sent me like this heads up message. You're like, just <laughs> so you know, <laughs> we live in like. A zoo. No, you didn't say that, but like something along those lines. I probably said that. Yeah, we classified ourselves as a zoo for a while. So let's just summarize what you had at that time. Yeah, we had five mice, uh, probably seven rats at that time or eight rats. A fish. A fish and a cat. Um, So now we have a cat, four rats and three mice. So it's it's less now. Yeah, I I remember I, I... I came like I'm. I'm not someone that can really like hide my expressions very well. Like, <laughs> and I remember I was just like visibly uncomfortable when they tried to like come up on me. And you're like, why? Why do you not like the rats? And I'm like, their tails. Their tails are like, ooh. But I remember you admitted that they're cute, but you just didn't want to hold them. Yeah, I was like, I like looking at them. And that's it. <laughs> I remember the first time they like crawled all over me. I was like, Ugh, like tickling and shivering. And like, oh, this is super weird. You want to talk about pole? Yeah, I want to talk about pole because it's so cool. Like I watch your videos and I'm just like, wow, I wish I could do that. Like the strength in your body is so awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's new. It's new. The strength is new. It's like, very new. She started. I've gained biceps. I didn't used to have them. Um, <laughs> upper body strength was never. I had a really bad injury in my undergrad. I had uh, costal vertebral dysfunction, which is where one of your ribs comes out of the socket in your back. Um, and then I also struggle with thoracic outlet syndrome, which is like compression of nerves and arteries in your shoulder and neck. So I've always had issues with my upper body and instead of like trying to build my strength, I kind of just avoided working on my upper body. But um, last January I got, I think it was a birthday present or was it a Christmas present? Anyway, my sister's birthday and Christmas are very close, but I got her and I a group on to do pole classes because she was expressed it was something she was interested in and I was interested in too. So we started going once a week for fun And then when our trial ended, we kind of signed up and continued doing once a week. And then when COVID hit, I really missed it. Um, And she like moved back in with my parents. So she wasn't coming downtown anymore. Uh, And I was like, I want to buy a pole, but they're so expensive. And then one of our, I think, you know, Kaine, but Mm -hmm. um, she ended up moving uh, to the states for a bit and she sold her old pole and I bought it and so now I have that and then I just kind of started working on it on my own you take zoom classes now I do zoom classes for a while in the beginning I wasn't doing any classes and I was just trying to like figure it out from Instagram and YouTube videos and I was doing it like five times a week for a while and Julian would just hear me yelling from the other side of the room and he'd have to come over and like try and get me down from the pole because I was stuck and didn't want to <laughs> smash my head Should open be on the like ground upside down like Julian <laughs> stuck on the <laughs> he's like what do you want me to do and i'm like just catch me um, save me but yeah i don't know it's empowering and the classes i go to are very inclusive like every type of person every type of body type any age is pretty much there so it just kind of shows you that it's never like a bad time in your life to just learn something new and, and... it's like a balanced They make it a balanced workout for an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you start with like stretches. You do a lot. You have to do a lot of flexibility and able to be able to do some of the tricks. Like I'm working on splits now, Um, and you also do like like you need a huge amount of core strength, upper body. You're hanging from your legs sometimes. Um, Yeah. 
And it's something, if you do have a pole, that you can just do in your living room. Yeah. Our pole is always, it's a permanent fixture in yeah. our apartment now. People don't realize it's there because we have our kitchen island up against it. We just push it out of the way. And yeah, our kitchen island is on wheels. So I just roll the kitchen island out of the kitchen and then I can just pull in our kitchen. But uh, Is that the adjective or the verb? Sorry. You're polling? Pole. To pole. Yeah. To pole. When I'm polling. One must pull. Did you make that up? Or? No, that's what they say in okay. class. Yeah. That's the, the accepted jargon. Yeah. Cool. And it's also just like there's so many different ways to do pole and I kind of didn't realize that going into my first pole classes like there's lyrical pole, there's like break dancing pole, there's like contemporary pole and then there's like pole with heels or without heels, there's oh, a wow. static pole like you do static dancing like the pole's not moving, you're the one's moving around it and then there's spinning pole where you're static and the pole is spinning. Um and then there's like floor work and chair work and I don't know there's just there's a lot of stuff you can do oh wow yeah I think I think it has this sort of reputation for being a sexual thing but it's it's so much more than that right it's like yeah I mean it definitely it got its start from sex workers for sure yeah every time you pull you kind of have to thank a sex worker because you wouldn't to do it without them um but it's also kind of like evolved beyond that and they're trying to get it into the olympics not beyond it but just like it's evolved in general because there's lots of different ways to pull i prefer like aerial tricks and like being up in the air and doing stuff my sister really likes doing like floor work and working with heels um it's both cool have you noticed uh, any benefits that it's had on your on your body like on your playing, on your on your your past injured body. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely stronger, um, less back issues, for sure. Um, but at the same time, if I am attempting something new and I don't do it properly, I have had days where I like get really sore and just have to like take a day off and lie down so I mean it's just like any sport you do you have to stretch properly and don't hurt yourself and um my mom's always like how are you doing this without a mat I need to get you a mat so that you don't break your neck and I'm like yeah probably probably a good idea probably (laughs) yeah that's awesome well I really want to hear about this concert you guys have coming up it's a charity function event yeah it's um So it's actually run, let me just pull it up so that I don't say any wrong things. Um, Because it's not our concert. It's run by um, a guitarist and teacher and composer named Mark Battenberg. And he's been doing this like every year for a long time, um, always on the winter solstice. And he usually does it in a church uh, in the East End. And instead of people having to buy tickets, he just asks for donations to the food drive. And so you just like come and you bring food and then you can attend the concert and then leave. So I did it last year um, and I got to play. He wrote a bunch of music for cello and uh, guitar. And so I played his pieces and I also played um, solo stuff. And it was really fun. And so we've had this existing relationship since working with him last year because he does eventually you know before COVID hit he had this plan of like doing a music video and recording some of his pieces for cello and guitar but of course that got put on hold um but we're doing the concert again this year um and this year we're including Julian because he has all of the recording equipment and also Mark wrote some stuff for trio now so cello viola and guitar which sounds really nice we were rehearsing it the other day um there's a little snippet on my Instagram um so yeah we're just gonna record it on the 18th which is this coming Friday and then we're gonna air it on the 21st Mm -hmm and it'll be good i'm not sure in what capacity mark is planning on doing the donations yet um i'm not sure if it's decided maybe he'll announce it at the concert but yeah because it being virtual people would send virtual donations or would they still drop off physical that's what i'm wondering but i think it will still be i think it'll be virtual donations okay so like monetary yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't think it'll be food this year because I don't know if you can do that with COVID. Um, 
So the date is, sorry, the 21st? The 21st, yeah. So, so. And and where can people view that concert? Uh, definitely going to be posting it on YouTube. Um, might also live stream it via Twitch. Yeah, Mark's there'll be kind links of, on Facebook. Yeah, links for Facebook. Definitely. Mark's kind of leaving the technical stuff up to us a little bit, so... Yeah, we will record it and then see what's best, but it'll definitely be on all of the socials, easy to find. Um, I'm going to play an excerpt from the uh, Casa de Solo Cello Suite, and Julian's going to play some Bach, and then there's going to be um, like Poet. some poems, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then Mark's compositions as well. Very diverse program. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this yeah. is cool. Never yeah, been on a podcast before. Yeah. <laughs> um, where can people find you um, if they want to contact you for gigs or questions? Where Where's the best place? Yeah, um, I'm pretty active on Instagram. I do like weekly cello tips or snippets of recordings, or uh, I record covers. And it's Kendra's Cello, K-E-N-D-R-A-S Cello. Um, or you can go to my website for uh, any upcoming concerts or if you need a quote. And it's just my first name, lastname.com. And I'm also on Instagram um, at Julian, J-U-L-I-E-N underscore M-A-N-N, man. Um, and you can also find me on Facebook. Um, uh, for any string session needs or performances. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys so much. And mm -hmm. I hope I get to see you in person sooner rather than later. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.